Good evening, and welcome to Monday Conference again. I suppose, uh, if you think about it, you would expect that the idea of the richer countries of the world helping the poorer countries would be one of those things uh, above and beyond serious criticism. I'm not talking so much about the way it's done, but about the principle itself, where it seems we're wrong. Dr. Debesh uh, Bhattacharya thinks that overseas aid to developing countries does more harm than good and should be stopped. Dr. Bhattacharya is an Indian and an economist. He began his academic career in Calcutta University and is now a lecturer in economics in Sydney University via Manchester University. Well, before we hear Dr. Bhattacharya's challenging views, what does Australia give by way of aid to other countries? In this financial year, we're likely to give about $425 million. $16 in every 17 of it will be official government aid, much the biggest slice going to Papua New Guinea, followed by Indonesia. Overall, the focus of our aid is Southeast Asia and the Pacific, though, of course, it's not restricted to those areas. The voluntary foreign aid bodies, all 35 of them, will spend about $26 million. And I suppose when most of us think of foreign aid in the everyday sense, it's the voluntary organisations which come to mind with their door knock campaigns and advertisements in the papers, etc. One of the best known of them is Freedom From Hunger. Its national director is Barry O'Hagan. Mr O'Hagan has just returned from India where he inspected some of his organisation's projects. The Freedom From Hunger campaign was established in 1961 and now has national committees uh, in more than 100 countries. So far, Australians have given $17 million to Freedom From Hunger Action for Development, to give it its full name. Harold Henderson is National Director of World Vision, which raised $5.3 million in Australia last year, making it our biggest voluntary agency by that test. The International World Vision Organisation was founded in Korea in 1950 and opened its doors in Australia in 1966. Well, Dr. Bhattacharya, uh, I, I take it you're not against mother love and kindness to animals as well. It's, uh, no. Clear that up. Right. Well, why are you? I mean, it's, I suppose, iconoclastic to most of us, to say the least, to be against foreign aid. Because foreign aid is detrimental to economic development. It's ill-conceived, it's insignificant, and I think it's doing a lot of harm now, especially from the point of view of poor countries. I think it would be much better if we forget about the foreign aid altogether. I'll give you very five short reasons why foreign aid is detrimental to economic development. First, a continuous so food aid might be detrimental for the development of domestic agriculture because of two disincentive effect. The first one, that if you go on receiving continuous food aid, the governments of the recipient countries would neglect the agricultural sector, which should be the foundation of the economy. It has happened in many, many cases. Secondly, because of this continuous food aid, it depresses the domestic market prices. And the local peasants do not produce enough food for their own country. So food aid is totally detrimental if it is a continuous one. Second factor is capital equipment aid or technology. Most of this capital equipment and technology developed in the Western world are highly capital intensive technology. Because it's evolved that way, Western countries have got abundant supply of capital and relative shortage of labor. Consequently, the technology here is capital intensive technology. If you transfer that capital intensive technology to poor countries where they have got abundant supply of labor and less capital, obviously you are going to aggravate their acute unemployment problem. And the third reason why we are against foreign aid on a theoretical basis that foreign aid aggravates the already existing inequality of distribution of income and consumption. The kind of thing which we see, that foreign aid is a process whereby the poor people in rich countries would be responding to their door-to-door -door campaign, and that money would be going to the rich people in poor countries. So this is the way it aggravates the inequality of distribution of income. And we find that foreign aid is also doing it great harm for ruling elites and some of the repressive governments are not functioning their proper role. I remember one government minister of a country which should be nameless, he forgot to pay his taxes for 13 years because he knew that whenever it's a problem, ruling elites do not have to pay any 
taxes. We have got the foreign aid as an easy option out. The, when you take sum total of all this effect on a theoretical plane, foreign aid is totally detrimental to economic development. You said uh, that you're against foreign aid on a theoretical basis or plane, but what about on a practical plane? On a practical plane, let me explain uh, the intricacies of foreign aid. I do not want to go into the detailed definition, but we will have to remember... No, sorry, can I just... Can I, let me rephrase the question. What I'm getting at now is, even allowing for the moment the validity of your theoretic, theoretical case, what about people in, say, countries like India who would have a much harder life, hard enough as it is now, that if the aid was taken away from them in a practical, everyday sense, wouldn't they suffer? Well, in extreme cases, they might suffer. Uh, I, grant, I grant you that. But to, from there, if you jump... But that's, that's a big concession to make, isn't it? No, 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 it's not a concession. Let me explain. Mm -hmm. uh, after the Cyclone Tracy, some small farmers in southern India contributed $160 as donation to the Darwin Relief Fund. And from there, if you jump into a conclusion, that 160 donation is a significant help in the economic development of Australia. Oh, I don't think anyone would jump to that. Conclusion. But this is the kind of claims which have been made by our people here on the left-hand side. They would come. That the smallest of small, insignificant amount of aid now, which might aggravate their inferiority complex, even in a theoretical plane, if the poor country, if a poorest or poor person is given the handout, and if he's becoming totally dependent on that handout, he might lose the initiative to stand on his own feet. The self-reliance, whether we like or not, is the basic factor in economic development. But, but again, I, I'm sorry to come back to this, uh, this level, but if, if you are malnourished, or starving, or you don't have the equipment to grow food, and someone gives you something that makes you well nourished, or gives you equipment with which you can grow your food, aren't you just better off? Well, if and at the same time, if it makes me feeling inferior to the donor, and if it makes me feel that I'm going to be treated as a beggar... No, but I'm talking about people who are so badly off that the only thing they can feel is hunger. Well, or in poverty. Uh, I think in that kind of situation, if you give the foreign aid and if you expect that the government should not do anything, foreign aid as a dole basis could never be a solution to their hunger. Well, I'd like to bring you both in there because obviously, if Dr. Bhattacharya is right, you're not only wasting your time, but you're causing a lot of harm among a lot of people. Barry, do you May I? Yes. Uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, you astound me. Uh, you absolutely astound me. For an Indian, an economist and obviously a very intelligent man. Uh, you obviously are not aware uh, of the more recent developments in overseas development. Do you want to make a brief comment well, on yes, that? Yes, yeah. I think I'll come here on uh, partly because of the fact that you're making a fundamental mistake. You're giving an impression as if uh, voluntary organizations like yours and World Vision could make a significant contribution. Just one, one minute, remember of the total foreign aid bill 90% of that comes from bilateral assistance, government to government, 90%. And nearly 10% comes from multilateral. Your contribution is less than even half of 1%. And so when I was talking about food aid, I was obviously talking about the majority part coming from under the bilateral assistance. Yeah, but Jay, don't, first don't forget that we are, you are debating the problem with two non-government agencies, not a government so, agency. So, so, so when I was referring my point of view, I was obviously giving the theoretical plane. Now, if you want to start now uh, on the arguments for this non-government voluntary organizations, I think I should be allowed to give my voice about them first, and then you criticize it. On an, on an international plane, when you establish those points, and then jumping from there to your very insignificant role of Freedom for Hunger campaign and World Vision, obviously we are arguing for cross purposes. Now let me tell you why I'm against all those uh, voluntary organizations. And then I think it would be better for you to give the criticism. Okay. Right? Well, well, before you do that, maybe Mr. Henderson should have his say and then you can deal with them jointly and then, <laughs> and then, then the audience, you can have your turn. Well, I think it, it might be best if I came in uh, uh, on the end of what um, Dr. Bhattacharya has to say about voluntary agencies, because I'm not in a position to uh, speak on behalf of the Australian government or any other government about uh, 
government aid, but it seems to me that we do come to a point where we are not claiming that we're going to change the world with voluntary aid. You might say that it's insignificant, but it isn't insignificant to the people whose situation it transforms so that they become self-reliant. It seems to me that it's a difference between doing nothing and doing something. Uh, can I just clarify one thing? Uh, although you can't speak, obviously, on behalf of government, you're not against government aid, though, are you? I'm not. Many forms of it, yes, I would be opposed you to You would be, all right. Well, that's, well, that, well for, that's... from the very fact that in 1974, the world international government assistance to third world countries, uh, only 20% of it represented real government aid. Yeah, no, I mean in principle. In principle, no. In principle, no. You see, Dr. Vachari is against it in principle, aren't you? Now, I'm sorry, but yeah. now we've got everything clarified, go. No, <laughs> I'll start from his. Doing something against doing nothing. If that be the case, doing something which is basically wrong, inherent, inherently unstable, I think it is absolutely crazy. It would be much better to do nothing in that kind of situation. <laughs> now, the main reason why I'm against any kind of voluntary aid organization, if I have my way, they should be disbanded, they should be eliminated, and if they are not prepared to be eliminated, let us have some positive campaign for a new international economic order, or let's have something on a global taxation basis. But the reason why I'm upset that let's take the World Vision One. You know, I have been reading the World Vision international literature and the Australian national literature in the last few days. And I gather from their literature that they have got this uh, action based on the evangelical Christian mandate. Normally, I would have nothing against a community of sinners trying to spread the gospel <laughs> of the Lord uh, if they restrict themselves to the rich countries. In fact, I think I would suggest that they should go to Sunday afternoon no domain to uh, have their guilt trips. But the fact that they are exploiting the poverty and hunger of the third world countries to promote their big business, multi-million dollar, and they're exploiting the sufferings of mother and children to establish some kind of voluntary aid, aid organization on the basis of wrong information. I'm totally outraged. I can't say, why are they exploiting them? They may not be helping them, but why are they if exploiting? You, if you look at some of their picture, a mother suffering and a child suffering, and then this compassion begging, emotional blackmailing, see, right. which go on to promote their own advertisement, for this multi-million dollar big business. That gives us a bad image. This is what happens when we come to Australia, and if I'm going to buy anything from any shop, and sometimes I get this feeling, people will be very kind to me. They ask, how long have you been in Australia? I said, six years. How do you find the people here? They're very kind, they're very friendly. It's not a, it's not a crime to talk to stranger. Then I pay the money, I come out, and the man comments, oh, aren't you lucky? You wouldn't have to suffer from starvation anymore. Now, this is a mild one. Remember, this is a very mild one. What has been happening because of this Freedom for Hunger campaign and World Vision, trying to put the picture that the problems of hunger, st starvation, are because of population explosion. And some of the ruling elites in repressive governments are convinced by about it. I'm obviously referring to the Indian case. We have been hearing stories that beggars from Calcutta, Bombay, Delhi are rounded up and then they are compulsorily sent for sterilization program. To me, this is a criminal act. And this has been perpetuated because of the wrong things preached by our friends on their evangelical Christian mandate. I think that's the reason why it's hurting the people. Well, I think Mr. Henderson deserves a right to reply on that, <laughs> on the evangelical mandate. Well, uh, I, I think there's so much that you've said there that is unfair. You have even spoken as if there are no Christians in India. They might be a very small minority of the Indian community. Are they not entitled to ask for assistance from fellow Christians in countries like Australia and America? Uh, I'm not clear. Uh, are you saying that, that your organisation helps only Christians? Sorry. No. Oh. I'm saying that our I'm saying that our organisation. No, I didn't know. I honestly no, did not know. Sure. Something you said that maybe. I'm saying that our organisation channels its funds through Christian organisations in the countries where we're working generally national Christian organisations. The people who are helped 
are people in need, regardless of whether they're Christians or not? Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, express our sincere, sincerest uh, thanks and appreciation to the government and people of Australia for this um, foreign aid. And uh, we, people of uh, developing uh, countries, I really need these uh, aids badly. Can I ask where you're from? Western Samoa. Okay. And uh, I'm wondering uh, how uh, uh, Dr. Uh, bases his uh, theory, whether he based it uh, uh, just in, on uh, fiction or on facts. But uh, we uh, really need uh, these uh, aids uh, badly for our developing uh, countries. I'm really surprised you say that you need aid. Don't you believe that if you really want to develop, you have got to start learning to stand on your own two feet? Because if you get aid, so-called aid as we call it, I shouldn't even call it aid because it's mostly it would be in the form of loan. You'll have to repay that loan. On an international plane, all the poor countries which have been borrowing uh, and getting so-called foreign aid, the magnitude of their foreign indebtedness is 150 billion US dollars. And each year, every one dollar you and I would be receiving in the poor country, 69 cents would have to be repaid to just for the existing old loans. In that kind of situation, if you really want to develop, you have got to start learning to be self-reliant because foreign aid is going to have a detrimental psychological effect on you. Uh, uh, have the uh, necessary uh, uh, resources that are uh, required to uh, de develop uh, the, uh, their countries. So if you don't uh, ask uh, and have these uh, aids, it means that uh, we are not uh, fully uh, developed. I so refuse I that implication. I refuse that, uh, to accept that implication. Every country in the world, case by case, we could show that have enough resources to satisfy the basic human needs of its population. I would like to know one country which does not have enough resources. Well, if they do, why don't they? It's simply because this hunger is not a problem of population explosion or available natural resources. It's simply because of the inequality, both at the national level as well as inequality at the international level. So when these people, especially World Vision, in their publication start spreading this misinformation that 10,000 people are dying from malnutrition a day, it's a total, entirely false statement. I mean, you should be ashamed of that kind of statement coming up from you because you want to get some foreign aid. Now, you should mention that why hunger, inequality, it's inequality alone which is responsible for this hunger. Let me give just three brief examples which everybody will, to, will be able to follow it up. During the 60s, Freedom for Hunger campaign always used to campaign on behalf of population explosion leading to hunger, which has been taken up by World Vision now. Uh, actually, That's not true. This is the way I have got the, uh, your own statement that 10,000 people are dying from malnutrition every, every day. No, but you, you, you just took us up on the question of uh, population explosion being the cause of hunger. That's, that's what you have been saying there. Uh, because that's the way you have been trying to put forward and get the guilt feelings out of the people so that you can get more money from your door-to-door -door campaign. No, that's not World Vision's position, I'm sorry. Well, whatever be your position, you have got to state me, why do you make that kind of statement on your printed piece of paper where a lot of people, normally we do not challenge you because we are lazy, we think it's insignificant. But when you start making it a big business, using international stars like Julia Andrews, Rolf Harris, and Bob Hawke, then we find that it's, it's not only intellectually unpleasant, it's hurting the poor people. What we should repeatedly emphasize, that if there is any hunger problem, it's because of the affluence in the Western countries. Would you believe the grain surpluses, which used to be available for consumption in the poor parts of the world, are now bought by the rich farmers in rich countries to feed their livestock. 60% of the American grain last year was spent on feeding cattle, sheep, pigs, and poultry. 
And that stock, if it was given in the poor parts of the world, it would have fed, it would have, uh, fed something like 1.3 billion. But, Doctor, to be fair, what you're saying is open to debate, isn't it? I mean, there is genuine disagreement over that as to whether the world is overpopulated or not. Yeah, I mean, you don't agree with it, but it's not disgraceful or stupid to argue that case. And you don't have to question people's motives. They may be wrong, in your view, but their motive doesn't, that has no bearing on their motives. Well, I would say they're wrong because intellectually they're not doing justice. A lot of no, serious economists who just, just disagree with you. No, serious research work has been done on this population issue. Almost everybody now believes that there is no global shortage of overall shortage of food at a global level. Everybody believes that population pressure is not responsible for hunger. Even they would, I think, agree with me on that point. Well, that's the point I was trying to make. You, you seem to me to be saying before that we were claiming that the hunger problem is because of overpopulation. And what I was saying was that we don't say that, and as far as I know, freedom from hunger doesn't say that either. Oh, I think in the, the income class structure, no, we are, I wouldn't claim at all that uh, population is the, the cause of poverty in the world. There's no way that that's true. Uh, I, I agree entirely with you that it's uh, the inequitable dis distribution of the world's resources, and perhaps the problem does lie back here in the Western world. And this is part of our educational program here in Australia to get this message across to the Australian public that we must put pressures on our government and the governments of the Western world to bring about the changes. Perhaps your new international economic order may be the solution. But in the meantime, while you are bringing about this change at international level, at government level, what is happening to the people who are striving for self-reliance in villages in Africa, in India, in South America? I think this is the role of organizations like ours, because we are bringing people and people together, people in Australia to people in India, and we are relating their problems to each other, because that is not only a problem in India, it is also a problem in Australia. We have poverty in this country, we have deprivation, we have exploitation, we have injustice. The same problems exist in India, and by bringing the, the, the victims of both of these problems together in an aid program, by linking an organization in Sydney to a small village uh, community-based organization in India, I think it's a very valuable exercise and it helps the people in, in Australia to appreciate what we have and to appreciate the fact that we are not alone and the people in India are not alone. Look, I mean, I'll just come into one thing. Just one thing. Uh, uh, I must say that it's a good psychological release and Freedom for Hunger campaign, although trying to obscure uh, their paternalistic role, their benevolent role, by saying that it's a kind of equality of partnership in development. Look, let's not kid ourselves. Equality of partnership would never come if anything is given as a charity. Dibesh, I challenge you, we do not treat this as charity. And no. I challenge you to visit some of the projects that I visited last week in your country and the people that I spoke to, and I would invite you to speak to them, they do not regard it as charity, they regard it as their human right to a share, an equal share in the world's resources. Right, I'll, yes, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Hagen said that uh, Australia's awareness of um, the problems of the third world have gone beyond the, the starving baby image. He speaks about development projects, big words. I wonder if Mr. Hagen can say very simply what he means by a development project. Uh, a development project, I make the distinction between simply a food handout situation in which food resources are transferred from this country to a country overseas. Uh, what Freedom from Hunger has been involved in today and for the past 15 years is in providing a small amount of resources, be it money, to enable a community, a village level community in a given third world country to become self-reliant through their own work through their own um, desire to become independent, their desire for a human dignity, their, their, their desire to overthrow the, the pressures and perhaps the oppressors who are making life so impossible for them, the people who are, in fact, causing them to be hungry. Uh, instances in the Philippines, in India, in so many third world countries where you have tenant farmers who are being deprived of a proper livelihood by their landlords. Now, a system whereby they can rise above this exploitation, that's where Freedom from Hunger can very effectively and very profitably uh, cooperate with third world communities. Yes, on the aisle there. 
Yes, uh, I'd like to first of all say I think that the aid is the other way around, really, and has been historically ever since the British went into India and the French went into Indochina and the Dutch went into Indonesia. Rather, they've been building up our economy by providing uh, through the plunder of the wealth of those countries. I think also, I don't think... <laughs> I don't think either that Mr O'Hagan and other speakers can uh, isolate help to a village from the actual social conditions in the whole of the community, in the whole of the society. For instance, what has happened to the money lenders? Mr O'Hagan oh, just well, said I'm that sorry. very thing. Yes, but I'm saying, what is, what, what is happening to the money lenders, for instance, in that village, or the landlords in those villages? What share do they get of this aid? Now, I like, well, okay, well, we'll get to that question. But I, I want to basically ask this question. Uh, I don't think that anybody on the platform can dodge the question of government to government aid. And that is, after all, the vast majority of aid that goes up. And I'd like to look, focus on the question of Indonesia. Now, it seems to me that it's a, second, that's a country that's getting the second largest <coughs> allocation of Australian aid. It is going to a regime that is the most uh, corrupt, perhaps, in the whole of Asia, and that's saying something, and is, uh, and is the, uh, uh, now in a war of aggression against the East Timorese people. Now, I can't understand, for instance, how we send cattle to Indonesia, and half them, or a lot of them end up on uh, President Sahade's private cattle ranch. But leaving that aside, I'd like to ask this question. How can uh, anybody, or can anybody on the platform, justify sending aid to Indonesia from the Australian government. And please, I'd like an answer rather than saying, well, that's not my field. I would not like to. I wouldn't like to try to justify it. Uh, I do have, as I said earlier, major reservations about government to government aid, particularly when it is tied aid, and more particularly when it is used as a political weapon. And our own foreign minister earlier in the year admitted that foreign aid from Australia uh, uh, is a tool of the Australian government. And that gives me major reservations. Your argument is really, though, isn't it? Or, is, or am I being unusually obtuse even for me here? Your argument is in favour of better administered. If you're right about Indonesia, it's not an argument against government to government aid. It's just that we're doing it the wrong way or, or we should be doing it in a better way, isn't it? Yours is a different point from Dr. Bhattacharya, who says it can never be any good. Basically, it's a question of to whom, to what sort of government does the aid go, really? I mean, I'm in favour of reparations to Vietnam, quite, quite certainly, yes. And if the Vietnamese decide they want certain forms of aid, let's have it. I'm also in favour, uh, in the past, uh, when, when Fetlin was uh, uh, controlling and liberated East Timor, of aid to East Timor on the basis of what East Timor wanted. You know, I think there's a difference between that sort of aid and aid to a corrupt regime. I, but, I don't think you can divorce, divorce it from the sort of government. Wouldn't you condemn, then, uh, poor people to suffering simply because you didn't approve of their government? Well, first of all, I think that that won't resolve any of those problems. It will help prop up that sort of regime. And God knows the Sahara regime needs propping up at the moment. And I think that that's the sort of aid that is, in fact, counterproductive because it props up those sort of regimes. But it yes. goes to the repressive governments which has got more, no concern for the vast masses of the population, the poorest of the poor, and which helps to consolidate their position. The interesting well, point to which, which countries would you send aid then? I want, I want to see. I would not send your, any aid to any now country. We're about your political perspective rather than aid. I would not send any aid to any but uh, any country in the world. And what about? Could I ask you then? I mean, where do you draw your line? Who's the goodie? Where do the goodies begin? Well, I, I believe that where you have a government that is really. Uh, doing something for the people, there's abolished, for instance, landlordism, money lending, all those sort of things. Well, then, if that government is prepared to accept aid on an equal basis, if, a, if it really is aid that's going to be acceptable to them and is going to be of use to them, and they're the ones who decide, not us, so, they're so not you, in favour of that. You would put conditions well, on aid. I, I, I'm yeah. totally against supporting the Thai military regime in any form or shape, or the Indonesian one, etc. The woman at the back. There, yes, go ahead. Dr. Bhattacharya's new international economic order, and I'd like Dr. Bhattacharya to explain what he means by this. Uh, he, well, you, he must do it, I suppose, but I thought we could talk about aid for a bit longer, but still, because, I'm sorry. Well, I think you know, this is a very important point, yes. and it's related to the previous question as well, that instead of putting forward false information, false propaganda regarding aid, we'll have to understand why underdevelopment exists what are the factors behind underdevelopment? 
Once you understand that the existing order was set to give a few privileges to a few selected countries who would set up the rules of the game, and all the benefits would be going to these selected rich developed countries, and they would be exploiting, I'm using the word exploiting, all the other vast majority of mankind. Now, this is where one has got to understand the relationship between development and underdevelopment, that they are the two sides of the same coin, that the poverty of the poor countries is very much a function of the wealth of the rich countries. Unless you realize it, then you would not be able to understand the existing injustices done to the poor countries following the existing international order. When you talk about new international economic order, all that we are asking, give the poor countries the equality of opportunity, a new chance, so that they are not be treated as beggars, getting a few crumbs from the rich man's grand table, but they would be trying to make their own breads on their own initiative. That the poor countries should be allowed to be the masters of their own natural resources, and they should be allowed to change all the existing rules, rules, monetary rules, market rules, financial rules, all which are favoring the rich developed countries. Once you started changing those rules and giving the equality of opportunity and making the poor countries masters of their own resources, then we could get the introduction of new international economic order. That's what we are asking for. If I, um, do you want, sorry. Do you want yes, our, uh, whilst acknowledging the, the great potential and value of the new international economic order, uh, I think, again, you must make a distinction between this level of action at international government level and the fate of people down at, at village level. Uh, I think uh, the people who are expounding this new inter international economic order, they've got something very valuable. It's a third world concept, and it may well revolutionize the whole structure of the world, and certainly may be a major threat to the Western economic system. However, in the meantime, uh, I feel that the people who are at present in need of assistance, the people who are actually striving at grassroots level for independence, for dignity and self-reliance, these people may well be, be neglected by your system. And this, again, I emphasize, this is the role of an organization like Freedom from Hunger. Well, I think you're still not answering the fundamental question. You look at voluntary aid over the period of time is no longer a vote catcher. Its role has declined in every part of the world. When you talk about aid, we talk about government to government, or that's the major aid. Yours is totally insignificant. Just forget about that for the time being. As it is going no, down I, over I, the I do not accept that it's totally insignificant for this reason. I think uh, an exercise in which aid agencies in this country engaged a few months ago uh, by launching a campaign against the government's cutback in overseas aid had a very effective outcome. That is a, a very significant role for non-government agencies in this country. I, I, as I, it's a good psychological release for you people doing this kind of job. Oh, right? gee. <laughs> Look, let's be realistic about it. Over the year, period of time, if you want to do any fundamental change, mm -hmm. we do not have to do this patch up job. Foreign aid, even by the government or even by your organizations, could never be a solution to the introduction or to the problem of underdevelopment. It can never be. Because your role, let's be realistic, is so insignificant in this whole world that one has got to understand that what all that you are doing is trying to build up consciousness in the developed countries. I admire you for that. That's one of the reasons I think I'm prepared to say Freedom for Hunger campaign is not going to be criticized by me that provided you change your name from Freedom for Hunger campaign and make it something it. action for world development or new international economic order. Oh, no, look. <laughs> or campaign for <laughs> Not something like that. Now, we have changed it, in fact. There is freedom from hunger action for development. No, the connotation, freedom from hunger, you know, the connotation has been so detrimental. We feel that we are never going to be accepted as equality of partnership if you have got this freedom from hunger campaign. Now, we really feel that this is the time. You say that new international economic order is a third world concept. It's not a third world concept. It's, it's an international concept. It has been passed in May 1974 in the United Nations. And it was also debated in September 1975. Australia is one of the few countries which do not publish anything about new international economic order. It's one of the greatest injustices done by our media that they never get the chance 
to know what are the detailed recommendations of new international economic order. 2,100 pages of documents have come out of it and giving you all the detailed slogans, what we want, so that the mankind could survive in a far better, more cooperative, harmonious uh, way. Unless you take the fundamental issues which are causing development as well as underdevelopment, unless you try to remove the fundamental barriers to it, patch up job is just wastage of time. Is this a fair way of relating what you've just been saying to aid? You, you want a new economic order, which implies a new political order, necessarily. Obviously, to change the economic order of the international community, the politics are going to be different. Are you saying then that aid given by developed countries to underdeveloped or developing countries is a kind of opiate of the people, that it, that it impedes the social revolution which you regard as necessary? Well, That's I've, the way in which it does. Am I understanding the case? I think it's, you're simplifying it, but it's quite all right. You're in the right track, I would say. <laughs> Well, I wonder if we can get on to that then, because, that's, because if you believe what Dr. Bhattacharya believes, then, then obviously, given that uh, premise, then aid does do positive damage. It stands no, in the way of the revolution. Uh, no, I, I cannot accept that, because uh, already, uh, in recent years, aid agencies in Australia, non-government agencies, have become actively involved in what they describe as conscientization programs in third world countries. Now, these programs are geared to social, economic, cultural, political, religious awareness at village level. Now, if, if this is, is uh, contributing to the oppression of the people, then you've got me. I, I can't understand it. Barry, can I tell you the Methodist Church of Bolivia, you know, which is also a church organization which is also involved with people-to-people -people relation, uh, they actually summed up the entire role of foreign aid in just one word. And the word is called neocolonialism. And would you believe that the United States aid agency wanted to help them for their programs, and they refused to accept it? I wish you know, all the people in the third world countries follow their lead. That this aid is nothing but a tool of neo-imperialism. And once we know it, let, let's go to the fundamental problem. Let's re reform the existing structure. Let us start giving more access to the third world countries let us introduce global taxation. Let us do something more positive than feeding false information and false concepts. Right at the very back. Dr. Bhattacharya is arguing on a political level, yes. and the two people from the foreign aid um, organisations do not want to argue on this level. They are disassociating themselves from the government aid, therefore automatically disassociate themselves from the political angle. But I put it that the aid organisations are very political, and the World Vision was giving aid to children in Vietnam, yet when the Vietnam went into communist regime, and there's still religious freedom within Vietnam, World Vision has stopped its program to Vietnam, even though there are Christians within Vietnam who might be asking for aid. But I don't know. I want to know why you tried to completely dissociate yourself from the political connotations of aid. I think that is very prevalent to the, to the argument that's going on now. And I think that's how you should answer about it, Dr. Bhattacharya. Mr. Henderson. On the Vietnam question specifically, uh, World Vision has approached the Vietnamese embassy in Australia about the possibility of going back into Vietnam to uh, re-establish a program there. Uh, on the question of the government-to-government -government aid that you raised, the point that I made was, and I think it needs to be clearly understood, that I have been invited here tonight as the representative of a voluntary organisation. I have no right to talk on behalf of the Australian government in relation to its aid program. The, the point that I would like to make about a voluntary agency's role in the situation is that I think it does provide an opportunity for ordinary people to transfer resources on a voluntary basis to other ordinary people who are in a situation that doesn't seem to be affected by all the schemes that we discuss and propose at a top level. I've read quite a deal of what Dr Bhattacharya is proposing, and I appreciate it and I travel with it. But I've also read lots of other proposals that have been brought forward at that level from time to time. And it doesn't seem to get down to the people who are in a village level. And I would think that voluntary agencies provide a way of putting resources into the hands of ordinary people so that they have some possibility 
of becoming self-reliant in their own situation and of using their self-reliance in, in their own terms. Now, I can't for the life of me see why that is, why that is demoralising to them. It depends on how it's done, but, but voluntary agencies are aware of the need to do this in an appropriate fashion and have, I think, done it in an appropriate fashion. I've travelled in, in, in some of these countries and have been impressed by the fact that work done by voluntary agencies, not only World Vision, is by and large geared to the poorest of the poor, who are the people that seem to me to get left out of the grandiose worldwide schemes that we discuss and that seem to take so long to, to cause anything to happen. And, and what guarantee do we have that this latest proposal, which has been adopted by the United Nations, uh, is, is really going to be implemented with any sense of urgency? That's not answering the question I was asking. I was asking you, you're completely, you're, both of you are apparently saying that you have no political connotations in aid and your views are non-political. But I'm putting it to you that they are, that your aid is political and that that's what you're not answering. I want to know, have you any, personally, or is your aid organisation got any political views of its own and does it express this through giving aid? Or are you completely apolitical, which I doubt? That's what I want to know. Are you politically orientated or not? Answer it. No. No, we aren't in a party political sense. We, we would acknowledge that if you put resources into the hands of people who have no power and no self-reliance at the moment, that action in itself could have social consequences and political consequences. It's inevitable that that action will but the consequences are in the hands of the people to whom you give the aid. Now, you know, a few years ago, uh, there was a lot of talk about um, uh, aid with strings attached, and it was directed particularly against missionary organisations and religious organisations. They were the people that did these things with strings attached. But it seems to me that we're in danger of going full circle, where we've, we've debunked those kinds of people but we've now come to the place where it's okay to give aid with other kinds of ideological strings attached to them. Now, I'm, what I'm saying is that I think the role of the voluntary agencies is as far as possible to bypass governments and, and the kind of activity that goes on at that level, put resources into the hands of ordinary people who will never have resources because of the conditions in their own country unless those conditions are changed. And, and if doing that, brings about social change and political consequences, then that's fine, but it's in the hands of the people who have a right to make that determination. Are you, uh, are you arguing that any voluntary agency must necessarily be political? It's just a matter of which side you're on. No I'm, not, no, I'm not saying that any of them, but I'm saying that they are by their actions, by the actions that well, occurred in Vietnam. What would be an apolitical? What kind of voluntary agency would be well, apolitical? Agency I'm not an expert on what apolitical would be, but I'm saying that an agency that would be prepared to look at any request and analyse it in a purely objective nature, whether the government be a terrorist regime, a communist regime or a democratic regime, all I'm saying is that it appears very apparent that foreign aid organisations in Australia are very selective. They only look at the governments and the countries that are going to help Australia, or that Australia has to support that they're the only ones that are going to get aid from Australian <coughs> foreign aid organisations, be they voluntary or government. Well, that's not true of the voluntary aid organisations. It's not true of World Vision, which is working in 40 different countries where the governments range from extreme right over into the communist bloc. Now, I think that answers your question. The, the, the countries where we work, and we don't work through governments, are the countries where we have offices established through which we can channel our funds. But we are operating in that way in 40 countries that cover a very broad political spectrum. Over here. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, gentlemen, yes, I had my eye a long while ago. I'd like to bring it to a practical level. Um, I think the danger with this sort of debate is that we always go into the theoretical and treat people just as numbers and statistics. Um, the fact is that in the world today we've got people with full stomachs and we've got people with empty stomachs. And I believe that we should be 
looking at the thing from what we can do as individuals to help people who are in real need, in far greater need than what we are ourselves. Now, I'm privileged, have been privileged to visit the countries where I've seen people in absolute need. And with all due respect to the doctor, I cannot understand why he really would have those particular attitudes in seeing the people who are literally starving to death. I'm privileged to be, be becoming a part of a program in Africa, in Kenya, Africa, where um, we have been challenged by the local people, one particular person who has a vision of what can be done in that particular country of providing water for people who literally travel all day, 15 miles a day, just to get a bucket of water for their own personal needs. And he's come up with a, a plan where his people can be involved in the project, where they can contribute to the project as much as possible, and where the whole community can be involved in helping themselves to a better way of life. Now, they can't get started. It's like an engine without a, a starter motor. They can't get started unless somebody is prepared to come in and work with them or just give them that assistance. And I believe that if we can bring it to a, an individual level where we can become personally involved, it's for the better of everybody. <laughs> I think I share your sentiments too. I do come from India too. I have seen starvation, I have seen suffering more than I think most people in this room. Uh, but the main point, and I'm also trying to solve the problems, but more in a scientific, objective way, and with also tremendous involvement and concern for the people. Instead of wishy-washy, you know, half-hazarded, things which are going to disillusion people, things which are basically wrong, things which are exploitative in nature, using suffering children and mother. What I am trying to suggest now, let us have new international economic order, let us have global taxation. What I mean by global taxation, instead of depending on charity, it will be a, the minimum requirement for every developed country to contribute to the development fund, not government to government level, not voluntary private organizations, but to the United Nations Development Fund. What I'm suggesting that most likely all of you know, in the current year, we have been spending $250 billion on arms. Let us have 10% tax on that. If this is the kind of slogan comes on, all the basic needs of every human being in this world would be solved. What I'm suggesting, let us have a tax on transnational corporations, which are the international pollutants. Let us have tax on the consumer durables, where the manufacturers in the developed countries deliberately make goods so that they can last only one or two years. Now, in that kind of resource wastage, what we have got to have positive policies. Try to point out how maximum amount of money can be collected, not as a voluntary charity, but as a matter of right, as a matter of duty to the international cooperation. At present, what we have got we have got all the injustices done to the third world countries because of our haphazard attempt. My solution, if you follow the introduction of a global taxation system, on many items, we can list n number of them, I think the solution would be far more feasible and far more practical than your solution on a voluntary individual to individual. Because Dr. we don't have that many people in this world. Dr. Bhattacharya, can I put to you, I suppose, a point that is unfair, but it's an obvious point to put to you. Following up the last question's point, in a sense, you can afford to wait for the new economic order or to argue about that, because your belly, like my belly, happens to be full now. But suppose, <laughs> but I, 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 admit, I admit it is an unfair point, but I think it's one that's got, it's got to be stated. Uh, I think you know, it's fairly obvious. What about the person who can't wait for that but wants a bowl of rice now? Now, what do we do about him or her? Well, if you look at the people, say, we have got something like 2,000 uh, 2, billion people in this world, 2 billion, I think, 2,000 million uh, people in this world who are very poor. Now, if you really want to help them, the magnitude of the problem would be so stupendous that the kind of solutions which are coming from bowl of rice would be beyond the comprehension of these individual private organizations. It is true that, I mean, if all the Indians were like me, obviously we would not have the problems 
of poverty and starvation in India. I don't have to be very modest about that. What we are saying, let us remember that it's trade, it's justices in the international migratory field, justices in the international financial arrangement. These are the big issues. One or two individuals are so insignificant that they would not be able to do any the job. If your if your type of solution, forget about me, that individual giving bowl of rice and solving the problems of the poverty uh, of the mankind, then I think I would support it. But as you know, it's never a realistic proposition. No, but you could do a lot of the other things that you want as well. But in the short term, what about a bowl of rice? What's wrong with that? Because in the short run, if you do the bowl of rice, all your energies are directed to the bowl of rice, and never do you have the time to find out the real enemy, and never do you have the time to put your energy to change the existing international order. That's the reason why let us attack the fundamental problem. I mean, I can easily tell you the example of one country which I visited very recently, China. China used to have foreign aid uh, from Soviet Russia until 1959 and look at the relationship between China and Soviet Russia now. Since this is what foreign aid does. Oh, well, it could, it, could be, it could be other factors too. This is what charity does. <laughs> now, my point here, I have, I have seen that Chinese people now do not receive any foreign aid from any source in the world. They do not have any poverty. They do not have any starvation. They do not have any unemployment. And that's the most egalitarian society I have seen. Now, that convinced me, India, in spite of so much of foreign aid coming from every part of the world, where Indian leaders tend to become biggest at the international rich man's table, they have never tried to solve the fundamental problem, and they have never depended on the mass participation. Let us get the people involved on a mass level, and the kind of involvement which is needed, it's a total sociological change, political change, economical change, and it would not be able to come if we just do all our bit through the voluntary organizations. This is my stand. Look, can, can I? We, we're, yes, you can, but I should point out that we are over time, but could you make it brief? Can I agree entirely with your, your dream for a new economic order, but in the meantime, uh, I think agencies like ours have a contribution to make, not merely in India or other third world countries, but in making the Australian public conscious of the power of this country to bring about the changes which ultimately will solve the problem of poverty in the world. Mr Henderson, do you want to add something? It must be brief, I'm sorry. But... Well, my concern is that the high-powered solution, uh, far from involving people in, in, in a practical long-range alternative, is going to remove many more people into inaction. And I think Dr Bhattacharya ought to be careful about turning off the volume of compassionate, and fairly well informed support that is being generated by voluntary agencies in a country like Australia. I don't think there's any guarantee that if you turn that off, that will be channeled into a long range, as you call it, a more practical ultimate solution. Mr. Henderson, Mr. O'Hagan, Dr. Bhattacharya, thank you all very much indeed for talking with us tonight. There'll be another Monday conference next week. Till then, good night. This edition of Monday Conference has come from the Tom Mann Theatre, Sydney. Our special guests were Dr. Devish Bhattacharya.